All right, we're back. I know it's been a minute since my last upload. There's been construction in the unit right next to me and the drilling sounds like it's in my fucking head. So we're doing what we can. This is temporary. I am starting to go to libraries to get some work done. Um, there's the update. All right, fossils are objectively cool. Animals have been on this planet for nearly a billion years that we know of because of fossils that we have found of various sizes from that time until now. Despite the overwhelming likelihood of their remains being destroyed by scavengers or the weather or time, the traces of these animals have survived millions of years, and on even rarer occasions, they're preserved in ways that don't even seem possible. Today, we are going to look at some of these objectively cool fossil discoveries. I say objectively because the last one I'm personally pissed about. It ruined my day when I found out about it. It's a recent one. I recognize that objectively it's cool. We'll get to it. So buckle up, grab a snack, while I show you some cool fossils I think that you will like. Fossils. Da, da, da. We usually get the general information out of the way, but there's not much that these fossils have in common with each other. I mean, they're all fossils. I could talk about how fossils form, but to be honest, I don't really want to. I mean, they're all big in this video, which is surprising. A lot of cool fossils are small and I'm sure they have great personalities, but today we're gonna focus on the big ones. We're actually gonna waste no time and we're gonna jump right into my favorite fossil, my personal favorite. So there's a lot of cool shit to be learned in science, right? Like you can see something or learn something and be like, whoa, that's cool. But then there's another level of shit that you see or learn about and you're like, holy shit, life is worth living, you know? like. It's shit that makes you grateful to be a human and be able to like understand what you're looking at. And for me, it's this. Okay, this is not a sculpture. These are the real remains of a dinosaur that was walking this planet 110 million years ago. One of the most perfectly preserved fossils in the entire world. Like it looks like it's sleeping and at some point it's gonna wake up, but instead it was encased in rock like this for 110 million years. It's called Borealopelta Mark Michelet. And it was a notosaur that was 18 feet long and weighed about 3000 pounds. They were covered in armor all over the top of their body, which took up a good proportion portion of their weight, and this armor was made of bone called osteoderms. So they had their internal skeleton, their endoskeleton, like we have in other vertebrates, but they also had this exoskeleton covering their entire body, made up of separate bone from their endoskeleton that served as defense. Skin bone. Osteoderms. So how the fuck did this happen? Like, how could this possibly fossilize this way? I think the best way to answer that- Get out of here! Check out these slides I got. Get out! I think the best way to answer that question is to start at the beginning, 110 million years ago. This notosaur was swept dead out to sea via a river or a mudslide. It was a terrestrial animal, lived on land, but it was found in a marine deposit, so it must have gotten there somehow, and it sure wasn't piracy. Due to their top heavy weight distribution that I talked about from their skin bones, it flipped over upside down like a Jeep in the water and floated for miles and miles out to sea until it eventually sank to the bottom of the ocean. Happened to settle into some oxygen poor sediment, which just so happens to be one of the best places for a carcass in the ocean to fossilize. If you're interested, take notes. Oxygen poor sediment slows down the decomposition process since little specimens aren't wrecking shit up as much. No oxygen. As a noticer's body decayed, substances like carbon dioxide were released, which changed the chemistry of the water in the mud surrounding the carcass and formed side right, a particular mineral. Don't ask me chemical shit. Just know the side right helped to retain the shape of the carcass as it fossilized, like stupidly well, obviously. This happened in what scientists call the Western Interior Seaway, which was a massive body of water that used to cut through North America 110 million years ago. Part of this seaway is now known to us as the Clearwater Formation in Alberta, Canada, a marine deposit where tons of marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs have been found and other marine animals from this time, along with some land animals that were swept out to sea, just like this guy, swept away by the ocean tides. And on March 21st, 2011, day before I turned 14, a heavy equipment operator named Sean Funk was digging here in an oil sands mine in the Clearwater Formation with this massive fucking excavator, like 30 feet big, and the machine ran into the fossil. Sean somehow noticed he had hit some sort of unusually hard rock and stopped what he was doing. It felt different than the rock around it. So he had his team inspect some of the pieces that broke off and they saw this. Those circles are the osteoderms, those skin bones, the exoskeleton armor of the notosaur. A nearby museum was contacted since this was clearly unusual and scientists got to work on extracting the rest of the fossil that was still stuck in the rock. Um, I'll draw a little diagram. Let's say rock. This is the fossil. They don't know what the fuck it is. The rest of it is on the floor. In order to get it out, because they didn't know what it was, they went around it, cut out big chunk of rock so as to not harm the fossil. They brought the big rock chunk back to the lab and then had to get rid of all the rock around it to see what was inside. And they called on the one and only Mark Mitchell to get the job done. This was a big job. The rock was massive 
and very hard. And as he chipped away at the rock and got to the fossil, he realized skin and soft tissues had also been preserved. So he had to be even more careful not to damage that because that shit is fragile, big rock, fragile pieces inside. So as you would imagine, this took a long time. How long, you might ask? Nearly six years, dude. 7,000 hours chipping away at this rock. That's high school if you were held back twice. That is a long ass time. And so in honor of him, rightfully so, the fossil, which describes a new notosaur species, was named Borealopelta Mark Mitchelli, which translates to Mark Mitchell's Northern Shield. Okay, so that's the lore. Let me, let me erase this. Now let's look at what the fuck we got going on. Borealopelta had osteoderms all over their body of different shapes and sizes. They had much larger spiky ones in three rows around the neck and then alternating rows of osteoderms and scales running down their back. They also had these like shoulder spines that were like a foot and a half long, which scientists suggest evolved to use in mating displays as well as self-defense. Almost the entire surface of this fossil is covered in preserved skin. And you know what that means? Possibly preserved color as well via pigment cells called melanosomes. Melanosomes are what give tigers their stripes or black jaguars their melanated color or give red pandas their cute little tails. Melanosomes, melanosomes, melanosomes. And in the fossil record, melanosomes are very hard to come by, but are sometimes preserved in two different ways. Eumelanin, which is black, or pheomelanin, which is red. Borealopelta had both, in a particular arrangement that suggests they had a rusty colored back with a lighter underside. This is big news. Not only does this give us a good idea of what Borealopelta looked like, but also what the fuck else was going on in their ecosystem. I'm gonna draw again. So let's pretend this is a good drawing of Boreal Pelta. So they had a darker colored back and a lighter. This is lighter down here. The sun typically casts a shadow so that it's darker under here and lighter up top. When you combine the darker color shading with the lighter underneath, with the way the sun hits the animal, they cancel each other out and create a two-dimensional looking creature. Makes it harder for predators to see them. Cancels out their three-dimensional shape. Erase, erase, erase. Countershading is an evolutionary response to predation pressure. Think of the smaller herbivores like antelope in the savanna that are being mauled by lions and leopards on a daily basis. They gotta at least try to blend in. And then the larger herbivores like rhinos and elephants are just one color, no countershading at all. Cause they just hang out. Nobody's trying to eat them, they're too big. Here we have this big ass rhinoceros sized dinosaur that had fucking spikes all over it that shows evidence of being countershaded like a puny ass little antelope. I know we already know this, but it kind of just serves as more evidence that shit was heinous at the time of the dinosaurs. The predators were out of this world, like nothing that exists today. You know, it's kind of just a reminder like, damn, that was messed up. There's a lot more I could say about this fossil because when I was researching, I hit the fucking jackpot with a source I found. One of the lead researchers on Borealopelta named Caleb Brown talked about the discovery and all the research associated with the fossil so far in an hour long presentation at the museum that was uploaded to YouTube for Free. I'm gonna link it in the description. I took notes on it like I had a test on it the next day, dude. And if you watch it, you're gonna be like, damn, she really did take notes. But there's a lot I left out because I wanna get to the next fossil. So if you end up watching it, let me know. But we're gonna move on. Next, this one made the coolest fossils list because it is definitely objectively very cool. Another dinosaur fossil. People think dinosaurs are cool. But it features more of the icons of the Cretaceous. There are fruit flies fucking in the air right now. What? Let's do a little game. Think of a dinosaur. Now think of a horned dinosaur. There's a good chance you have first thought T-Rex and then Triceratops, two of the most recognizable dinosaurs known to humans today. If you didn't, feel free to leave a hate comment. Please don't, please don't, I'm sensitive, please don't. Now imagine that these two dinosaurs were found together and not just kind of near each other, but like intertwined with each other in what appears to be mortal combat or alternatively a little dance. Well, that fossil actually exists. It's called the Dueling Dinosaurs, found on a ranch in Montana in 2006 by a fossil hunter named Clayton Phipps. He initially found the Triceratops pelvis eroding out of a hillside and after months of on and off digging, realized, holy shit, there's a Tyrannosaur in here too. All of the bones are in their natural position or articulated just like Borealopelta. So hopefully in the near future, it'll be able to provide some insight on questions about each of the species and whether or not they truly died battling each other. You might be thinking, wait, Lindsay, you said it was found in 2006. How do they not have those answers yet? That's a long time. Well, believe it or not, this fossil was locked up for 14 years because of core battles and legal <laughs> shit. And I'm gonna give you a recap of it. Yeah. This just temporarily became a law video because I wanted to learn about it, so I figured you would want to as well. My credentials for this particular part of the video are I took a criminology class in my freshman year that was supposed to be for third and fourth year students and had a lot of prerequisites, but they threw me into it anyway, and I failed it. But I did read some legal documents, so buckle up. Like I said, Clayton Phipps found the fossil in 2006 on a ranch he was surveying with a team in Montana, a ranch that just so happened to have some complicated ownership history. It initially belonged to a family called the Seversons. They used to own all of it, but then for a period of time, they co-owned it with a family called the Murrays, the Murrays, the Murrays, the Murrays. I'm gonna assume it's Murrays. And then in 2005, 
the Seversons sold 100% of the surface estate rights to the Murrays, as well as a third of the mineral estate rights. So obviously the surface estate is like whatever they do above ground, and then mineral rights is like below ground, the minerals they find in the ground. In Montana, mineral rights cover any gas, oil, hydrocarbons, or minerals found in the ground on that piece of land. So the Seversons still own two thirds of those mineral rights, but 0% of the surface rights. Those were 100% owned by the Murrays. So then fast forward to 2006, the dueling dinosaurs were found on the ranch, along with some other fossils, including an additional T-Rex, which are obviously worth a lot of money. All of a sudden the ranch is raking it in, like tens of millions of dollars. And so the Seversons are like, hello, we need two thirds of that since the fossils were found in the ground. And the Murrays were like, shut the fuck up, okay? Shut the fuck up. Fossils aren't minerals, the money is mine. And so this battle went on for years in multiple different courts. And what it ultimately came down to was, can dinosaur fossils be categorized as minerals under Montana law? Paleontologists ended up getting involved in this because this was gonna have a huge impact on future digs based on the outcome. If fossils ended up being considered minerals in Montana, it would make future digs practically impossible because of how complicated mineral rights are for a specific private property. So getting permission from everyone who has a piece of the pie would be like, it just wouldn't happen. So a huge group of paleontologists and a group of Montana landowners came together in support of the Murrays to make sure fossils would not be considered minerals. And luckily that's what the court decided in 2020, 14 years after the fossil was found. At this point, paleontologists were just twitching and shit, ready to get their hands on those bones and conduct juicy research. The fossil was sold to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and now science is there studying it and also preparing it to be displayed, which is supposed to happen in 2024. Hooray! As far as I know, there hasn't been anything published about the fossil since it was moved to the museum. I mean, it's only been a couple of years, so the only real information I can give you right now is the questions that they're trying to answer, which I found on the museum's website. The obvious one being, how did they die? Were they actually dueling? They're also hoping to find preserved molecules in the skin, gain insight on the famous Triceratops frill, maybe find feathers in the Tyrannosaur. There's also questions on whether or not the Tyrannosaur was T-Rex or a different species called Nanotyrannus, which might not even be a valid species. It might just be juvenile T-Rex. That's just like kind of not certain in science right now. But this Tyrannosaur fossil is thought to be the only 100% complete T-Rex fossil in the entire world. I say thought to be because probably like half of the T-Rex fossils ever found are hidden from science, from people who just bought them. People with like millions and billions of dollars, which is lame to say the least for scientific discovery. So like who really knows? That's a whole other thing because fossils found on private land can be sold commercially. And that fucking sucks for science because a cool fossil can be discovered. A museum can want to buy it, but then a billionaire can come in and be like, suck my dick, and the fossil will just disappear forever. That could have happened here, but luckily it didn't. Because this is one of the fossils that has the potential to teach us a lot about the species involved and how these animals lived back then, just like Boreal Apelta. Against all the odds, they managed to be preserved, hidden in rock for millions of years, and humans just so happen to come across them by accident. But this next one, I personally wish they would put back in the ground. A few days after I went looking for blue whales and said the blue whale is the biggest animal to ever exist that we know of, over and over, a paper was published describing a new species of prehistoric whale that might be the heaviest animal ever recorded, the new champion. It's named Prusitus Colossus, and I'm fucking pissed. Okay, that sounded like I'm salty, but I'm not. Okay, yes I am. Not to be a brat, but I like being able to say that we live at the same time as the biggest animal to ever exist, that we know of. And I know situations like this are why I say that we know of. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just talk about the fossil before I start complaining about it. So, about a decade ago, a paleontologist named Mario Urbina came across what seemed to be a massive vertebra in Peru, bigger than any vertebrae of any other animal ever. His colleagues were skeptical and thought maybe it was just some weird rock, because it just looked weird, and it was so big. After years of excavating, it turned out, yeah, it belonged to a gargantuan whale that took so long to excavate because it was too heavy to move at a fast pace. After all was said and done, the team had 13 vertebrae, four ribs, and a piece of the pelvis belonging to an animal unlike anyone had ever seen anywhere else ever. It was dated to be somewhere between 38 to 40 million years old. Let me just state the obvious. The bones look fucked, all swollen, and like root vegetables. That's what's bizarre about it. That's what tends to happen on a smaller scale to lineages that go back to the water, like marine reptiles, manatees, and whales. They evolve bone mass specializations in order to properly exist in the water. And for shallow diving, slow swimming species in particular, their bone mass tends to increase in two specific ways. Their bones get denser, osteosclerosis. And in extreme cases, their bones get thicker, pachyostosis. And what you're looking at is a combination of both. Pachyosclerosis, this thickening and densening of the bones of this creature made their vertebrae almost 
twice as heavy as that of the blue whale, and their total skeleton is estimated to have been two to three times heavier than that of a blue whale. Objectively, absolutely sick. Subjectively, I'm devastated. But as of right now, I reject Perucetus Colossus as the heaviest animal ever. Only one partial skeleton has been found, and the total body mass estimated range is fucking huge. It's like 85 to 340 tons. The average is like 180 tons, which is around that of a blue whale, but we just don't have enough information. So I'm gonna hold on to the blue whale as long as I can. I like being able to say we live at the same time as the heaviest animal to ever exist. That we know of. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next long form video, which is another episode of What the Fuck Is This? And you can keep up with my short form content on TikTok and Instagram. Check out my Patreon for live streams and our community Discord server. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya!